The Brainiac Corporation. Just another day. From all over the country, a crack team of the finest minds arrive at their base. Morning. Their mission, to push back the boundaries of scientific knowledge. Oh, mate. So come on in, step inside with us, but prepare yourself for a bumpy ride as we embark on the worst excesses that are Brainiac Science Abuse. <laughs> Welcome to Brainiac, the science show that wipes its nose on the sleeve of science. The big science tonight. We ask, pants or tights? Which is the best DIY bungee? Can you play fruit machines for free? We inflict more suffering down at the lab. Rip. And stand well back. We put more stuff in a microwave. And more caravans into orbit. wondered which is Britain's stretchiest material? <laughs> hmm, but what sort of test could you do to find that? DIY bungee jumping, of course, but you can forget your fancy harness and your clever bungee cord and your fiddly carabiners, because we're going to be testing to find out which is Britain's best DIY bungee cord. And to do that, we've enlisted this, a very, very big crane. The drop zone has been roped off and we're ready for our first bungee jump. Tights, the stretchiest substance known to man, or more typically woman. But then it is a modern world, so anything goes, hey. The secret ingredient in tights is elastane, which is two to three times stretchier than rubber and a third of the weight. But will it stretch when it's got a brainiac hanging off the end of it? Perfectly safe. Of course, the one snag with tights is that they do have an inherent tendency to tie themselves in knots, which may hamper their bungee abilities. Come on, brainiac, untangle your tights, we're waiting. Rather him than me. OK, I think finally we're ready, so... Brainiac, we're ready for you. Jump! Ooh! Oh. How long was that drop? 100 foot. And how long was the tights bungee cord? 100 foot. You see, this, this is one of the basics of bungee jumping. You need the rope shorter than the drop. Definitely. So what we're going to do is, from now on, we're going to have a 50-foot length of each material we're testing. So we need to modify the bungee. We definitely need a new Brainiac, and we need to get a move on, OK? Right, let's do it. OK, we've now got 50 feet of homemade tights bungee cord, so that should be a bit more realistic. Oh, I tried to get another Brainiac to go on the end of it, but there were no volunteers, so I've had to use a mannequin. But the results will be the same, and the legal guys were a bit happier about it. OK, we're ready. Here we go. When you're ready, throw the mannequin Brainiac off. Yeah, you're going to need to tie it on at the other end. This, again, is one of the basics of bungee jumping. Oh, for crying out loud. <laughs> well, we've looked further into this, and you can see quite clearly the tights just snapped. So, in the end, tights just not up to the job. Let's try something else. Pathetic. Next up, the good old elastic band. Springy, stretchy and very, very, well, elastic. Perfect, surely, for the job at hand. OK, Brainiac in the sky. Three, two, one, chuck it off. <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> 
On the good side, for the first time, we hit the drop zone and um, nothing's actually come off the mannequin. It's stretched and it is actually singing in the wind. That's taut. I think that's as far as we can go with it. I think we count that a success. And so, our final elasticity bungee cord test is, well, pants, really. No, literally, it is pants. Knicker Elastic is almost custom-made for this job. Each individual fibre is woven into the pant cloth, giving it extra strength. It should protect the elastic from breakage, so there should be a bit of bounce in these boxes. Here we go. On my count, drop the pants. Three, two, one, go! A success! Ah. That is science at its very best. Pants, then, are the way to go for your DIY bungee jumping. So our mannequin really did fly by the seat of his pants, proving that knicker elastic is indeed the best, and indeed only DIY bungee. breath. It's a perennial problem and not just for French people. It's time we did something about it. So, what is the best way to get rid of stinky breath? <laughs> it's universally understood that the worst kind of breath is that brought on by garlic. So, into the lab we've brought the most pungent of those foods we can find. Freshly made garlic mushroom pizza topped off with sauce. Garlic, of course. And for good measure, a dollop or four of minced garlic paste. With a side serving of garlic bread, this lot should do the trick. Eight. Brainiac breath is vile enough without added assistance, but today we're really upping the stakes. These three have to eat to capacity, and then a little bit more. We determined to ensure their mouths become little hothouses of halitosis. These boys won't be kissing their girlfriends tonight, if they had any. Garlic is famous for outstaying its welcome in the mouth. Its sulfurous compounds feed the existing bacteria to create a heady cocktail of noxious aromas that's hard to budge. Little bits of it hang around in the hidden depths of the mouth, meaning that once in, that pong's guaranteed to stink people out for days to come. Plentiful sucking and licking of a fresh bulb should finish the job off nicely. And rest. Now the period of gestation, one hour. The mouths must remain closed to nurture the perfect environment for garlic breath. All burps should be swallowed. The air must be retained and circulated. Nothing must be allowed to escape. One hour later... Time's up. ..and the full pungency has kicked in. A quick top-up with a handful of garlic capsules and they're ready for the treatment. Bring in the cures. We've picked the three top breath-battling contenders. And start. Parsley, baking soda and mint. A light sprinkling of parsley is traditionally added to the butter in garlic bread. It's a half-hearted attempt to counteract the bad breath that usually accompanies this side dish. The quantities we're using today, though, should have more effect. The chlorophyll packed in this herb should have an antiseptic effect on the mouth to stop the growth of toxic bacteria. It's the traditional method, but will it be the best? Baking soda is a Victorian remedy for stinky breath. Relying heavily on its ability to change the acidity levels in the mouth, it's important to get it deep into the recesses to prevent the bacterial growth, which often stimulates unpleasant fragrances. Brushing and sluicing for this brainiac, then. And finally, mint, meeting fire with fire. A strong flavour for a strong odour. Its neutralising effect makes it a favourite for purveyors of bad breath. But can it do more than just mask the smell? With a plentiful variety of minty sweets, this Brainiac's giving it every chance. 
So with one full application of their chosen remedy inside them... OK, that's enough. Nighty-night. It's straight off for a good night's sleep. Eight hours of shut eye and shut mouth should give plenty of opportunity for those noxious flavours to circulate round their gob. The next day, we've asked them not to brush their teeth. No change there, then. And also not to open their mouths till testing. We want to give that halitosis the maximum chance. So now it's judgment time. The method? Well, there really is no alternative. Open wide, please. Deep breath in. Exhale. <sighs> so, pretty grim, it would seem. This brainiac's breath was pretty foul to start with. Open wide. Deep breath in. <sighs> and exhale. <sighs> and baking soda hasn't helped much. Open wide, please. Deep breath in. Exhale. <sighs> oh. A foul, minty garlic blend. Misery for anyone close to this brainiac for the next week. A few moments to regain full consciousness and the answer. Right, the results. The least unpleasant breath, and therefore the best solution to garlic breath, is parsley. So there it is then. Parsley. Now go and brush your teeth. <laughs> one for you. Do octopuses have arms or legs? Stop! The following experiment is dangerous. Do not try this at home. No, really, don't. Petrol is, of course, highly inflammable. When it's in a confined space, like a balloon, it becomes the explosive part of a bomb. When the foil attached to the balloon reacts with the microwaves, it produces a spark, which ignites the petrol and... produces a fiery explosion. We do these experiments so you don't have to. Do not try this at home. Fizz or will it bang? The regular chemistry conundrum, as posed by Dr John P. Kilcoyne, principal lecturer of the University of Sunderland. So, what chemicals has Dr Kilcoyne got in his shed today? Hydrogen peroxide, potassium iodide. Will it fizz or will it bang? We'll be giving you the answer shortly. Earlier, Dr John Kilcoyne of the University of Sunderland posed the question, hydrogen peroxide and potassium iodide. Will it fizz or will it bang? The answer? It fizzes. When hydrogen peroxide mixes with potassium iodide, it oxidises it rapidly. This creates a lot of heat, a lot of steam and a considerable amount of fizzing foam. What a great fizz! Nice one, Doc! Which is the scariest ride at the fun fair? You've got one ride left. The park's about to close. Which do you plump for to maximise that adrenaline rush? This Brainiac is being wired up to a heart monitor. We're looking for the biggest high and the best average for each of the rides we're choosing for her. We're using the wussiest Brainiac we've got. She gets dizzy on high heels, so these babies are sure to get a gorge rising. First up, the big wheel. Her average resting heart rate is around 80, but we're hoping we might be able to double that. The biggest kick on a big wheel comes when you look down. The fear of falling made worse if you suffer from fear of heights, which, fortunately for our experiment, our Brainiac does. On this machine, her highest heart rate kicks in right at the top, 150 feet up and a heart rate of 135. Not bad. 
I think we can do better than that, though. The waltzers. Three minutes of vomit-inducing gyroscopic misery. A slow start to lull her into a sense of false security. Doesn't feel too bad, does it, Brainiac? Ah, but what about now we've found the accelerator? A good steady 154 before it all slows down again. And just when she thinks it's over... Oh, it kicks off all over again, bringing on a very satisfactory new high of 157. Lack of control is what makes these rides stressful, the feeling that there may be an accident. If you do the same ride a second or third time, you tend to feel more in control. You know the dangers, so there's less stress. This Brainiac, however, is not getting a second go at this one. For her, we've got some fresh hell lined up. The roller coaster. A good ride, but rather disappointingly for us, it only produced a high of 150. Though on the plus side, she was very nearly sick. Never mind, let's try this. Maybe we can finish her off on Wipeout. 157, still the mark to beat then. Quite apart from a high heart rate, the stress of a scary ride affects your body in other ways. Flushed face, a feeling of tightness in the neck, sweaty palms, constipation and even diarrhoea may kick in. Worth bearing in mind if you're watching a bit too close to the ride. For some pimply, adrenaline-seeking youth, this would be sheer pleasure. For our Brainiac, unadulterated misery. But hey, she knew the risks when she wrote in. And right at its worst, our Brainiac's heart rate reaches a stunning peak of 168, beating our previous best by miles. A fine score. And she looks like she's had enough for the day. But we haven't, so it's on to the final challenge. Terror Castle. This one's been voted the scariest ghost train ride in the country, and we've got the wussiest Brainiac. We must be able to beat 168. When faced with stress, the body's primitive responses kick in. Like when a caveman faces a wild animal, the body prepares itself for either fight or flight. Neither option particularly easy when you're whizzing around held in place by a safety bar. Rather gratifyingly, we did get our Brainiac up to the highest average heart rate of all the rides, but at the peak, only up to 161. Second best then to wipe out, now officially the scariest ride in the fairground. You can rest now, wussy Brainiac, till tomorrow's bungee jump experiment. Science, the Brainiac alternative to happy hour. I tell you what, do you like football? Not really, no. Oh, I'll tell you what, you like this. Okay. This is pub football. Um, what you've got to do is score a goal between those goal posts using that potato, and you've got to get it through the goal with that. Go on, off you go. Clock's ticking. Beep! That's it! Go on! Come on! It's not very easy, is it? No. It's very difficult. Right. They must be an easier way. There is. Here we go. All you need to do is trap a column of air with your thumb like this. The air gets compressed. Oh, damn it! <laughs> the air will get compressed. Oh, get me a better potato. <laughs> Stop laughing. This is serious. No, seriously, it's a rubbish potato. It is. Oh, no, it worked. It worked. I've got it. I've got it. Et voila. A goal. Well, enough of your nonsense, Slapper. Get out. Stay out. You're barred. Brainiac. Every week, the Brainiac office is inundated with your emails asking to see experiments with thermite, the fiery substance that's as hot as curried dynamite. This is one of your requests. It's from Josef Maxted from Camber. My dad told me about this stuff called thermite. He says it's so hot, it won't even go out if you throw water on it. Can you tell if it's true? Because sometimes he makes things up just to make himself sound clever. Well, we could try putting thermite out with water. Or we could use ice, which is just the same as water, only colder. This is thermite. It's a powdered mixture of iron oxide and aluminium, which, when ignited, burns at 2,500 degrees Celsius, which is very, very hot. This is a solid lump of ice, the kind used to sculpt pretty castles or graceful swans. This particular block of ice is going to be sculpted by thermite. It might not be pretty, but it will be science. 
packed into the slow release mechanism of a garden flower pot, the thermite is ready for action. The fuse is lit. Under normal conditions, this ice would take 12 hours to melt, but this is thermite. Not only does the thermite burn through the ice, it actually makes it explode. This is because the heat from the thermite breaks the water molecules in the ice apart, turning them into hydrogen and oxygen gas. The hydrogen and oxygen gas then ignite and explode, turning back into water and blowing the block of ice apart in the process. So there you go, Yosef. Rather than being extinguished by water, thermite actually makes it explode. Thanks, Thermite. 47 Second Science. Big science questions answered in bite-sized chunks. Can you play a fruit machine for free with a coin on a string? Attach a coin to a piece of string and you can drop it into the slot and pull it back each time. Of course, the string has to be thin, so cotton it is. When it's fed into the slot, the coin goes through the internal mechanism and lands in a holding area. It used to go all the way through and you could then pull it back, but the machines have been altered and now it analyzes the coin and spots the sellotape. So on go the brakes and stops the free play. Worse still, the machine then closes the gap, so you can't even pull the coin back. You lose your money as well. So no, you can't get free plays on a fruit machine with a coin on a string. 47 Second Science. Big science questions answered in bite-sized chunks. I can do science, mate. <laughs> science you want done. You write to us and we'll give you the tools for the job. This week, we're in Wakefield, grabbing a snowboarder by the name of Sam Lee. If you're lucky enough to be selected, then you too could be picked up in style by the Brainiac team and chauffeur-driven to our top-secret, state-of-the-art research laboratory. Get your thinking caps on and your ideas into us. Who knows, we might just pick you. It's I Can Do Science Me with Charlotte Hudson. Hmm, what a fetching red envelope. So, what brings Sam Lee down to this place today? What great science question is troubling her huge, inquiring mind? Dear Brainiac, if I stand in front of a fan, I get blown about. But if I put two fans facing towards each other and stand in the middle, is it the same as there being no fans? God help us. Wind power. The solution to mankind's future energy needs, or just a thing that blows your hair about? Not something that's going to be answered by some bird and two gibbons in a scuzzy old warehouse. But at least we do now know that if you stand in front of one fan, it will blow things. Hankies, paper and candy floss right out of your hand. So, Sam Lee has established that a very big fan does blow her around quite a bit. Very good science indeed. The practical implications of an experiment like this are endless and, indeed, beginningless. Will two fans pointed at each other produce some kind of vortex? A vacuum? A black hole? If not for us, this question would go unanswered. And then where would we be? So, the paper tissue. Will it drop to the ground? Well, no. It does take up a rather interesting upwards flight path, but it's not quite the same as being in front of no fans. The newspaper? Well, ditto. Still difficult to open and tricky to read. And the candy floss? Well, it behaves just like you'd imagine a fluffy sweet snack would do faced with two big blowing machines. Her name is Sam Lee. She wanted to know if two fans facing each other was the same as no fans. The answer? Nope. I can do science, me. Granny Brainiac, homespun science from the nation's favourite old dear. Oh no, Bunny. All this fast food has made me spotty. Oh, don't worry, dear. I'll fix it. Getting spots from greasy food can be a bit of a nightmare. 
Granny always has a solution. Just apply a dab of toothpaste. It dries the zit and inhibits bacterial infection. However, Granny needs a lot more paste to remove that stubborn spot. But we can lend a helping hand. Here you go, Granny. Just dab a bit more on and you'll get the job done in half the time. Thanks, Granny. Good as new. Ah, oh, yes. Granny knows best. She certainly does. Homespun science from the nation's favourite old dear. <laughs> Things John Tickle's body can do. Come in. Stand over there for me. Now, Miss Sticker, what can we do for you today? Nurse, I'm bored. Can you show me something interesting that I can do with my body? OK, let's try this. I want you to place your little finger into your mouth and gently move it around, touching the roof of your mouth. It's usually impossible to tickle yourself, except for here. Eventually, you'll come across one little spot which is particularly sensitive. If you find it, it's very tickly. I found a really ticklish spot. Thanks, nurse. That'll keep me amused for hours. Not at all. Bye-bye. One more thing John Tickle's body can do. <laughs> this is a cream cake. It contains 14.7 grams of fat, 30.4 grams of carbohydrate and 3.7 grams of protein. That's all very important information for nutritionists. But you know what? I don't give a stuff about all of that. What I really want to know is... What's the best food to use in a food fight? OK, you're at dinner. You've got your best suit on. Maybe it's Christmas. You're having a really jolly old time and then some half-wit at the table next door to you throws a bread roll. Well, you've got to retaliate. Of course you have. Question is, with what? Well, we're here to find out. Over here, three brainiacs. Note the target shapes on their T-shirts. Over here are three more brainiacs in front of a table laden with the finest food. Soups, cakes, jellies and even pies. This is going to be so much fun. We need judges, we've got judges. Dragged kicking and screaming from a physics lesson, this sample of great British youth will mark each food category out of ten. Soup, main course, pudding. OK, we're about ready to do this. We're going to use soup first time. Couple of important points. First, it's quite sloppy, which I think will be good to scatter. Then there's that good old favourite missile, of course, the bread roll, which is technically part of the same meal. Notice also the plates. These are paper. Now, we could have gone for china. Personally, I would have liked to have done because they make a better noise on impact. I'm thinking head. Think. But we've gone for paper because we're here to assess the efficiency and the effectiveness of the food stuff, not the crockery. Right, we're about ready for this, so Brainex, up on your feet, please. Here's how it's going to work. You stay behind your lines, whether you're throwing or being thrown at. Throwers, on my command, I want you to throw three bowls of soup and the bread rolls at your respective targets. OK, everybody clear? Good. Right, here we go. I'm going to just retreat. No, actually, a bit further, I think, about here. OK, if we're ready, Brainiacs, here we go. This is it. Three, two, one, throw. And we're away. There's the first set. Oh, no. There. Food fight wise, soup is not the best projectile in terms of accuracy of shot as it does distribute widely in the air. However, it really pays off when an accurate strike is made. The underarm approach really pays dividends here, getting straight to the target. And the bread roll, also known as the torpedo roll. Well, they always hit the mark, although they are a little dull on impact. I think, I think that's it. Brain actually, you're out of ammunition. Um, oh, you are in a bit of a mess, actually. Interesting thing with soup, we can see that in terms of accuracy, it does suffer. Apart from one good headshot there, which was magnificent, the rest of it, you lose a lot on the way. That affects your speed as well. But in terms of splatter, it's just, well, it's magnificent. And the judges agree. A very creditable spread of sixes, sevens and eights out of ten, with an overall average of 7.7. .7. A good start for the starters. 
Right, that's the starters done with. It's time for the main course. Important thing about the main course, plenty of variety on the plate. We've got sprouts, which should be good as bullets, I would think. Um, the peas are going to be good for scatter. Carrots, don't know, aerodynamic, but I'm not too sure. We've also got some real heavyweight stuff here. The good old pie and mashed potato, which should be interesting. So, we'll give this one a go. Brain X, if you're ready as throwers, if you're ready as, as, uh, as targets, I'm going to retreat. Same again, same from the judges, of course. We'll be watching. Here we go, Brain X. Three, two, one, throw. Yeah. Right, here we go. Let's have a look. Well, the main course does have the advantage of variety. The peas travelling at a different velocity than, for instance, the mash. You don't get the satisfying splat you get with a well-aimed bowl of soup, but there is far more accuracy with a sprout or a pea. All good bouncing off the body material. Is that it? OK, good work, throwers. Um, that's... Oh, that's, that is a mess. Now, this is impressive. Partly helped, I think, by the soup, because things are sticking to it, but we can see there's a good scatter there. Um, some accurate stuff, that's... That's a bit of sprout up your nose, isn't it? Yeah. That, again, very accurate things, those little sprouts. OK, plenty of mashed potato here. Good! The judges, however, are less enthusiastic about the main course, averaging a lowly 4.8. So now it is time for dessert. We've got something a bit unusual we thought we'd try. Semolina. Not what you'd expect at, you know, a really posh dinner, but look at that consistency. I think that'll be good for scatter. We've got jelly. That'll be great. This could be good as a big, heavy missile. Should be accurate. Cake. And then, well, we couldn't do this without that old standard, of course, the custard pie. This, I feel, is going to be very messy. I'm going to retreat. Brainiacs, as before, don't go over your lines on my shout. The judges are watching. Three, two, one, throw! Right, this is it. The first one, there you Already go. the pudding shows its class. A hard cake missile followed up by some quality jelly and semolina. And the icing on the cake? Yep, the custard pie. Solid, moist, gungy, but full-bodied. Anyone can make a custard pie work. In the hands of novice and expert alike, you just can't beat it. And I think we're there. Last one, here you go. Thanks, big noise for this one. OK. That has, um, yeah, there's, there's definite scatter. The brainiacs are almost completely covered from head to toe. That's the scattering effect of the, uh, of the desserts, obviously. Surprisingly, the cake's very accurate, and I would imagine, though they're not showing it, quite painful. All hail, then, to the custard pie. Mostly nines and tens, and an average of 9.4. So, what have we learned? Right, well... Forget about the starter. Don't bother throwing that. Just get through it as quickly as possible. Then get to your main course. And here's my advice. Don't throw that either. Eat it. Conserve your energy. Save it all for pudding. The best thing officially to throw in a food fight. Will it break or will it bounce? The big question answered by Professor Mayang Lee and a 10-foot drop. Today's object, a yapping toy dog. So, will it break or will it bounce? Stay tuned for the answer. But first... Earlier, we asked, will a yapping toy dog break or will it bounce? The answer? A yapping toy dog bounces and continues to yap. Here's a situation I'm sure you've found yourself in. You're just about to go out, you're completely ready, and then, at the last minute, eek! Unsightly body hair, and you're completely out of hair remover. What can you do? Down at the lab, three men ready and willing to test out the best alternative hair removal products. And nestling beneath their outer garments, that feature so beloved of the fairer sex, the hairy back. A solution, though, is at hand. Duct tape, flypaper or sticking plaster. Which is the top follicle ripper? Women do tend to whinge a lot about how painful a process this is, alongside going on about the pain of childbirth. But our men are made of sterner stuff. 
we think. The strips are on. They need a minute or two to bed in and grip those fine hairs. Now is the time. The fast rip or the slow tear? We're going for the former, the short, sharp shock. Partly because it's the most effective method for pulling out whole individual hairs. Brace yourselves, please. But mostly because it makes it a bit more fun for us. And rip. It would bring tears to the eyes of even the hardest man. Now, the analysis. Each hair must be prized off and logged. A truly unenviable job, attracting, as it does, somewhat less than the minimum wage. The biggest number of hairs accumulated on the stickiness, the best waxer. Time, then, for the results. The best method for hair removal is the flypaper. So, for catching flies, unwanted body hair, or just a bit of mindless torture, always go for flypaper. Can you do your job whilst being electrocuted? Tracy Henry is a checkout operator. Introduce her to some low-amp 9-volt electrical equipment and you have yourself an experiment. Next customer, please. The current this kit carries produces electrical impulses to stimulate specific muscle groups. Ah! <laughs> and it doesn't take long to throw her off her rhythm. Obviously, a shot for Tracy. It was a little surprising to her customer as well. When the current is passed through her, through the pads, ah! her muscles automatically contract, like making it difficult to work. It also stimulates the pain response. Oh, my God! Ah! Triggering a selection of unusual screams and yelps. <laughs> Small zaps or big. Ah! It does seem that working at the till is a lot harder when you're wired up to the mains. <laughs> All good till operators check cartons of eggs to see none broken. Somewhat pointless when they end up hurled around the store. Ah! Checking the price of a bag of flour is the last test. You can have a price from that, please! Yeah! It's the final proof that serving at a supermarket till is something you can't do whilst being electrocuted. <laughs> Here's one for you. Who was the first person to see a cow and say, I think I'll squeeze those dangly things and drink what comes out? <laughs> the lad on the left is John. The lass on the right is Jane. And today, these prime examples of man and woman are going to find out if it's better to be a lad or lass when remembering things about people. John and Jane are being treated to a picture presentation. It's the Brainiac photo album. Now, you might want to pay close attention to these photographs because scientists reckon that lasses are better at remembering appearances than lads. We've asked John and Jane to put scientific theory to the test and see who can best remember details about the brainiacs they've seen in these snaps. In a fun time to stand up for your gender. The first question is, what pattern was on the Parisian brainiac's coat? Noticing someone's appearance uses both sides of the brain. In women, the left and right hemispheres are better connected, making women better at noticing appearance and better when it comes to remembering. Looks like our specimens are ready. The answer, the pattern on Parisian Brainiac's coat, was, of course, leopard skin. So, has Jane's neurological advantage helped? Uh, no. So, one nil to the man brain. Next question. What was Thunderstorm Brainiac holding? OK, it's the midway point in the competition, and we eagerly await a sign of Jane's superior mental ability. Still waiting. The answer was a rubber duck. Let's see what they got. Pad, book, rubbish. Well, it's still 1-0 to the lad, and it's the last question. What colour was the jumper worn by the Laughing Brainiac? Jane's playing for the draw. Against all scientific predictions, John is on the verge of a glorious victory for himself and his gender. As for the jumper, it was red with green Christmas trees. Lovely. So, what have they got? 
another correct answer for John, and the results of our test are quite clear. While lasses may have brains better equipped to remember people's appearance, in practice, it's better to be a lad. Well done, John, the lad with the lady brain. Join us next time when we'll be finding out if it's better to be a lad or a lass at seeing coloured objects. The humble toaster, a harmless device for browning off pieces of bread or a potential death trap. Well, it all depends what you do with it. For instance, don't do this. Everyone knows, of course, that toasters can be lethal. It's a familiar scenario. The bread gets stuck, Dad prods a big knife inside and zap. Out go the lights and someone has to scrape his blackened body off the ceiling. Well, they do warn you not to do that in the instruction manual, so it really is your own fault if you do it. But they don't warn you not to do other things. Dynamite was invented by Swedish chemist Alfred Nobel in 1867. He also invented gelignite, so in many ways we like to think of him as the founding father of Brainiac. And Alfred Nobel would probably be the first in line to warn people away from introducing slabs of his powerful explosive to the inside of a toasting machine. Rolled out, sliced up and stuffed inside, dynamite will only explode when it's exposed to an electrical charge, much like you'd find inside the walls of a family toaster. Plugged into the mains, it's just one small switch to destruction. Obliteration is more or less instantaneous. One moment a toaster, the next a shower of sparks and flying plastic. Warning enough, if you should need it, do not put dynamite or indeed any explosive material inside your toaster. Oh and yeah, do not try this at home. Hi, this is Carol Smiley and you're watching Brainiac. Why do you sound like this normally? Good stuff. Oh, I like it. Welcome, you join us on the seventh green for this unusual pairing in this pro celebrity golf challenge. Top golf professional Jimmy Spence takes on Brainiac. The spectators have been gripped by this tussle, and now it's come down to the final green. Fairly unusual game of golf this, we've got eight caravans, each filled with a bomb and a different chemical. This week it's rubidium fluoride, and as we've seen when the ball goes in the hole it will set off the fuse wire which travels up the flag and along to the caravan, setting off a huge explosion and a different colour flame, depending on the chemical inside. And it's Brainiac to putt first, certainly holable this one. Jimmy doesn't look too worried, he's seen this chap's putting before. Maybe just a little borrow. Oh, he's really mishit that. He's going to face a very tricky one back. Or is he? I think Jamie's given him that one. And he's holed his butt all right for the match. And to start off, the whole explosive process. Not much time for recriminations and blame. That caravan detonation is now only moments away. They're going to have to leg it pretty sharpish, I think. There she blows. Rubidium fluoride is mildly radioactive and ignites spontaneously in air. Burning at 775 degrees centigrade, it has an attractive purple flame. The inferno is fierce, but very short-lived. Another explosive and wildly dangerous game of Brainiac Golf.